Okay, Skyler. All right, so welcome back. This is our uh, back to school edition of our subcommittee meeting for the GAFAC, the uh, Industry Partnership Subcommittee. Uh, Boris Arati, again, DFO for, from GSA, and uh, looking forward to uh, rejoining the conversation. I was not able to meet uh, at the last meeting, but uh, Stephanie was uh, able to do that. And um, so looking forward to discussions today. I believe uh, Kristen is going to be traveling, so uh, Farad and I will we'll kind of tag team here and get, uh, get this uh, discussion started. So before we go any further, I'm just going to do um, just a quick roll call of who we have here. So I can see we have, and you don't need to identify because I can see you here right on the screen. So we got Farad, David, yeah. Nigel, Daryl, Mamie, and Susan. Ray. So I'm gonna go just a second here and I'll go ahead and take care of that. Just a second. All right. Great. So um, uh, again, Kristen is going to be traveling, so she's going to try to join us by phone later on today. Um, believe we're going to have much of a, a working meeting here, so it'll be good to sort of get wrapped up. And uh, we've got a busy fall coming up here. And for us in the government, we're, we're also in the uh, end of our fiscal year. So a lot of us are definitely picking up a lot of steam here to, to close things out well and start a new fiscal year. So I'm gonna turn it over to Farad and then Farad, I'll share my screen in a minute here with the agenda and, and so on and so forth, but I'm gonna pass it on to you. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome everyone, good afternoon. If it's afternoon where you are also, uh, I hope that you're safe from um, the fires or the hurricanes or tornadoes and the storms. Yeah. Um, we know we're in an environment where, unfortunately, we we have demands um, on us, on our business world as well as in what's happening in the real world. So I pray everyone's safe and secure. Um, um, as Boris had indicated, Chris is not going to be here, so we'll have a, a discussion. She will probably join by phone. So we'll just kind of continue forward. Um, she did forward the um, agenda source so that we would go through it and make sure we could be able to get through some of the information that we had before us. So um, we had a good, robust conversation in our last meeting, but I did want to cover some items that we wanted to kind of continue to go forward. Um, we did have a chairs meeting around ensuring that we continue to move this work forward. We've got back some information from the administrator, some on our feedback for our recommendations. So we'll talk about that a little bit, or you may have received it. But we want to, want to make sure that we continue this work, um, particularly in the, this environment, uh, including uh, discussion about industry partners. We're going to talk around speakers and other things today. So um, I do want to talk first around our work plan. So we have this work plan discussion and we have the schedule for that. I wanted to make sure that everyone received the email from Kristen early this morning. Yes. Yes. All right, great. So we've got the work plan. So you'll see those dates, the August 30th, 13th, um, September 13th, September 27th, October 11th and so on. So, um, Boris, did we send out invitations, reminders for people to put this on their calendars? Just unmute myself. Uh, yes, we have. Um, I have sent, uh, and you're probably getting a lot of invitations in your inbox. You see that Boris, got probably the only Boris, you know, by now coming into your inbox. Uh, so we have sent invitations for the public meetings, but the public meetings are posted on the Federal Register Notice. And I also send invitations for the administrative meetings. Uh, so definitely those have gone out. We will send reminders before just to make sure that we we let everybody know. Unfortunate thing about Google uh, Calendar is that when you do repeating meeting and you make updates, it doesn't automatically update your, your calendar. So the email that Kristen sent has some dates. Make sure that those dates gel with your calendar. So you definitely want to take a look at your calendar. And if you see industry partnerships, subcommittee meetings that are not on this ones, they're probably from the old invites, if that makes sense. So that's, that's the one unfortunate thing about Google Calendar. It doesn't automatically update. If you're within GSA, it works beautifully. It does updates. 
But if you're outside, it does not do that. Yeah, but you also so, set up um, cancellations for the old invites, I do believe. I, I do, but it doesn't, it's not automatic, unfortunately. So even though I send cancellations, sometimes it's, it's kind of hit and miss. So that's why you definitely want to go by the dates that are in Kristen's email. And those, those should all be in your calendars. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so in our last meeting, we talked a lot around this kind of work plan with two groups um, that really deal with some of the recommendations. One was the innovative new entrants and the climate and acquisition maturity model. And we wanted to kind of break down um, the our membership into one of those two groups. I hope you all were able to select um, which group you would want to serve in as a subgroup to really make sure we advance this work. Um, I, volu I volunteered um, Nigel for the innovative new entrance or voluntold. He didn't even know because he missed the last meeting. <laughs> but I just want to make sure I, I indicate that everyone else has a right to be whatever group they want to. But um, were y'all able to sign up for those groups of boards? So we have a recommendation or a list of people in each one of those groups. Now, first, let me pause. Can you all see my screen? OK. Yes, yeah. sir. OK, great. Um, so I haven't. Uh, for I've seen uh, what the, the final list is, and I don't know if you all responded directly to Kristen, uh, she would have an account on who all responded. So to, to answer your question, I have not seen that, right? So maybe, I, I think it, it let's, I, I would want to take that burden off Kristen. So maybe we need to make sure that we have GSA have that information. So when we have to do subgroup meetings, we can make sure that we have your participation as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe send out a meeting note, maybe send out a notification to the members to indicate that they know what group they're in, right? I mean, we want to make sure that we get participation because if they start having meetings, I know that I'm going to be in the innovative new new entrance group. And I know that um, Kristen's going to be leading the kind of clients and acquisition maturity model group. And we want to make sure when we come back together that we have good conversation. So um, we can look at who's, and if we don't, if people don't decide, we can kind of, again, volunteer them to the group. If they want to move, once they go to a group meeting, we can do that. I'm just trying to be very efficient so we can get continue our process. Um, how does the group feel about that? I'm just keep the conversation going. So at least the members on this call, um, have have you all decided on what group you're going to be in? Yes. I believe I have, yes. I'll be on the innovative new entrance, apparently. Yes. <laughs> okay. So are, is that is that the one? So catch me up real quick, because again, I'm I'm a little bit jet lagged and, and still recovering. Um so are we still looking for guest speakers to participate in that? Because we still have some businesses that are in these innovative spaces that are either smaller businesses that, you know, this is the target audience for our uh, uh, Shark Tank and also some large businesses who are already in the space who are looking for strategic partners in the federal space that are in, you know, already already doing some of this work. So are we still looking for speakers for the, the series of meetings that we're gonna be having on the calendar that we just saw? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that as we get forward. So, um, and a lot of the innovative new entrance conversation will be ensuring that we have a robust conversation of who are those people and how it makes sense to the work that we're trying to do in procurement and environmental work. So, yes. So, again, if you're on this call, if you want to chat or email Boris, let's just make sure at least this group is together. And then Boris, maybe what I'm thinking is that we can send a list out of people who have already made some decisions on what groups they want to be in and then send out um, with blanks for people to see that they're these are the people so far, the, the new innovative mm -hmm. group, these are the people, the maturity model group. We're just trying to get more people engaged in both of them. Yeah, and we'll, we'll confirm with uh, Kristen because she may have received some uh, emails directly to her. So I just want to make sure we confirm with her. But yeah. yeah, once we have that, we'll do that. And, and just a word for, for the group is we are doing right now two task forces out of the policy and practice. So kind of, and, and actually, David, you sit in, in at least one of those. I think, Nigel, you sit in on one of them as well. 
Um, so we're, the way we're working those is with the task force, and I think this will kind of follow the same model. Uh, we will do smaller group meetings. Um, typically, we'll try to find what works for everybody. And then sometimes we'll have subject matter experts come and uh, do some discovery. And we help pull those together as well as you all. And those meetings will, will help set those up and then facilitate the discussion. So we've been doing that with uh, the two task groups that are working on PFAS. And the other one is looking at tech tools from policy and practice. So just kind of sharing that for, for context a little bit of what, what you're doing here might kind of follow that same model, if you will. I don't know if that, that makes sense for us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, and I also want to speak to Nigel, your conversation on the work plan for what we're going to do with the new entrance group. It was a really exactly what you're talking about, identifying mechanisms for leverage and develop categories and challenges for the 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 prize competition and and all this was on that document that was sent out by Kristen. I just wanted to make sure and on there so far were you, myself, Mamie, Clyde, and Daryl. And so far we have on the client and acquisition maturity model group, Kristen, David, Kimberly, and Stacy. And so I just want to make sure we 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 iron that out. Um, so when we start calling for additional meetings, we'll be able to come back together to talk through that. This is Susan. You guys can put my name under the maturity model. Oh, thank you, Susan. Okay, and I'll make a note of that. Uh, for, uh... Thank you. Um, we did want to also talk around any other questions on those, the two groups and what we're going to be doing. We'll probably be sending out invitations or um Survey monkey on dates that we will be able to meet in between these meetings um, so that we can talk more around a robust conversation during our administrative meetings. And, and just another word on those meetings. So we've had a couple of them with the other task groups. Uh, those tend to be, again, we're looking for, we try to get the majority of people at those meetings. Not everybody's able to make those, but they're usually about one hour in length. And the purpose of those meetings is to really dig into what, what a recommendation is going to look like. And so, because we are, if you, you know, if I scroll back to the, the timeline here, uh, this November 16th is fast approaching. <laughs> it's like a train coming at us pretty quickly. And so you want to keep that in mind as, as you're organizing and looking at what, um, what's going to look like for, for recommendations. So, and we're starting to get some traction on those two task groups uh, now that we've, we've had a couple of meetings. So those are really helpful because that really helps focus the, or the conversation like new entrants. So for example, you have some ideas here uh, of how to organize this. If we're going to do some challenges, are we looking at sustainability in textiles or uniform? That's just an example. I think Kristen did a nice job at putting something together here. Um, you know, what kind of mechanism will we use? Challenge.gov, which I talked about uh, a couple of meetings ago. What kind of outcomes we're looking for? What's the price? Uh, and then what's this, uh, who should champion or sponsor this event? And obviously this is gonna be a GSA category. I see that, that the example she had category leaders. Um, did any of you sit in on the meeting yesterday with the acquisition workforce subcommittee? I'm sure that any of you were at that one. So we had a, a really good, and I'd recommend taking a listen to that when you get a chance. We posted the recordings, usually about a week. Um, we had the category management leadership come to present to the subcommittee. It was wonderful. It, it, it's amazing how much leverage these categories hold across the board. And six of the 10 categories are at GSA. So we have a tremendous amount of the spend, the whole federal spend that gets kind of organized under these categories. Uh, but anyway, so I digress a little bit here. So just kind of put that out there. Just just a little more of the, the, the context and what those meetings will look like. Back to no, you, Farah. No, no, no. I think that's a great way for us to start talking around uh, potential speakers. I'm hoping that we can get potential speakers to come through our, um, our two groups that were set up. Um, and, and I know I'm picking on you, Nigel, um, and, and I know Daryl and I have talked around this, is around making sure that we have potential speakers that speak to issues um, of concern around building out the model of inclusion. And so in addition to the climate control, and we want to make sure we have uh, more um, diverse speakers to speak to all the issues. So 
I know we've had people in the past, so there was been some recommendations for the former USPS um, for the maturity model, uh, Greg Crabb and, and John Braze, um, but I also want us to look at maybe industry partners that we can also include in our discussion for potential speakers, and we'll bring them to this full group to discuss. But as y'all are thinking through that, be mindful if you have ideas for people who could be speakers at our for our meetings, please uh, forward those to Boris, myself, and Kristen to really evaluate and discuss so we can bring before the whole group to determine and set up times because there's a whole process to be a speaker. So we want to make sure we get that going. So let, let me add uh, another comment on potential speakers. I'm going to make you guys dizzy here, but I'm going to scroll back to the, the work plan. So if this is Kristen didn't know how handy her email was going to be today, but this is perfect. It's exactly what we need to talk about. Um, so if you look at these days, we ideally want to bring speakers at public meetings. However, we can also invite speakers at administrative meetings, and this would be um, subject matter expert discussion. So we're basically trying to understand more about programs. So that gives us more flexibility in finding dates that work. And, and we could even schedule special meetings with some of the uh, subject matter experts if we need to. Uh, but do keep that in mind as those of you who are thinking about speakers, uh, these dates again will be the ones to work with. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be just the public meetings, but just uh, that thought I'd throw that in there. So that that's a good point, because I think some of the folks that I was thinking of, um, there are a lot of questions about how we reach out to some of these uh, non-traditional communities. And one of the areas was the, uh, that I was, uh, we've been talking about was um, the Community Navigators Program is run by SBA uh, and, and I think MBDA as well, but it's a grant program that literally helps organizations go and reach out to, uh, to, to uh, bring new entrants to the public sector, particularly federal. Um, that may be something that we bring to the administrative meeting, not the public meeting, because the question is, how do they reach these folks and how can we leverage those mechanisms better that already right. exist in order to bring those folks to the, the, those innovative companies to the space? Um, with regards to the administrative meeting, uh, there may be, because one thing I want to find out is what challenges are, if we can identify some of these small firms that uh, non-traditional that are looking to enter the marketplace, what are the challenges? What are the difficulties they are having entering the federal space? And I don't necessarily want that to be a part of a public uh, you know, uh, conversation. I want it to be open and, and frank, um, but not necessarily a, you know, complaining session about what's wrong with federal government, why the market's hard to do. But if we can identify what the challenges are from a small business perspective, entering the marketplace, maybe that'll help us come up with some suggestions for GSA and how to address those. I, I want to get folks input on that because I don't, I don't want to seem like we're not being open and, and, and transparent with every, all the conversations we're having, but I also don't want it to be a public complaining session about what's wrong with the government. So, so one, one, one thought I have, um, Nigel, if I may, is I think we can do a, like a focus group format where we could bring a couple of folks. And we've done that with the acquisition workforce subcommittee a couple of times mm -hmm. where we brought like, uh, within GSA, we brought groups of people that work in specific areas. And so uh, what we do is we have questions before we like five to six, maybe 10 questions, and then we send them ahead of time to the participants so they know what we're gonna talk about and they can prepare. And those have actually been very effective. Um, you don't need that many people for a good focus group, you know, three, four people maybe. And then you sort of guide that conversation in a way that's gonna be productive for this for the subcommittee. And then what we do is like, let's say the meeting is from three to five, we have the focus group from three to four, and then they can stay if they want. But what we do after that is the subcommittee members will have a conversation about what insights, takeaways they picked up. And then they'll do a Jamboard, if you remember the, the trusted Jamboard. And then people put stickies on, on that. So I think a focus group format works well. Um, it, it would be great to bring some industry perspective because we've heard a lot from the government, but I, I think it would be really helpful to, to start hearing from, like you say, and I, I think you mentioned this before, Nigel, 
um, to really start hearing from industry folks. Um, I mean, I know many of you represent industry, of course, we, we're hearing from industry because of you, but it would be good to bring some companies to the table and, and really have these discussions with them. And um, I'm also thinking not just companies, but organizations that represent these companies because yes. they're seeing it on a broader base. Um, and so I do have a, su a suggestion on that. Um, and I'll send that to you. The other one I'm wondering about with all of the challenges to Title VI, Title VII, and all the interviews I've been having lately on what's going to happen with all of that. Do we need a speaker to come in and talk to us about that? Because that's going to add another barrier, I feel, to um, getting new entrants in. Because how the federal government is going to deal with, you know, all of these new developments may be key. Yeah. Could, could you say a little more about, about that, Daryl, just so that for the group kind of getting well, this a, whole a challenge field. of diversity. Okay. There's a big challenge of diversity. And um, it all started with the uh, Supreme Court uh, ruling in, um, in the schools and in the, in the universities in California. And then now we have the state of Texas who is also challenging corporations, DEI programs. And, um, and we know that's gonna come to the federal government. So now what we're saying is that, that corporations are going to have to, in, have to um, encapsulate diversity inside of their ESG programs, which is okay. So they're saying we want to be socially correct. So we have to care for all different types of people and that's how they can do their whole diversity programs. But right now they're all being challenged on whether or not they can have diversity programs and whether or not they can even call it diversity. We're hearing that, you know, you need to now start calling it inclusion. I am not the expert. Um, I'm still reading on it and trying to get caught up on it, but there are some experts. When I was in the vineyard, there was a whole discussion with Skip Gates and some lawyers. And I mean, they were the experts of what's happening with this, what's going on with this. And I'm just thinking that if we hear from one of those speakers, at least we have an understanding of that because trying to bring in new entrants is probably going to be affected by it. Yeah, those are good points. Definitely any suggestions you have on speakers, um, please pass them on to, to Farad, uh, Christine, and myself. Yeah. Uh, okay, I would uh, like to get the executive director of AEC Unites, which is specifically to the architectural engineering and construction industry, but it's um, an organization to push inclusion, not just on talent, but also on um, businesses, with businesses. And so... Um, she's very well versed. Um, she came out of the ABC, which is the American Builders, um, whatever it's called, ABC. I can't remember right now, but it's a big uh, construction um, organization. But I think that, and she's been speaking a lot on it. So she would be somebody I would suggest. I'd like to piggyback on that. So the Sixth Circuit made a decision, uh, came with a decision, I think it was out of Tennessee around the 8A program. Hmm. And the presumption of socially economic disadvantage. Yes. So I'm thinking the Small Business Administration and what the Department of Justice's uh, guidance is to federal acquisition executives uh, around the 8A, 8A program. And if it will be any implications for uh, economically disadvantaged women on small businesses as well. So, right. So maybe there's, uh, we're following that extremely closely uh, at my firm. Um, so a couple of things. Tomorrow's uh, August 31st, the Eastern District of Tennessee is going to be doing their final report out from that. Uh, what we're seeing is DOJ is very likely to um, uh, to to uh, file um, an appeal on a number of grounds coming out of that discussion tomorrow. Uh, so we'll know a lot more information tomorrow afternoon, probably around this time. 
Um, but as of right now, there is no impact on the women's programs or some of the other programs because what this specific decision went after was that presumption of economic disadvantage of race conscious programs. So that unique specific target is what they went after on this one. But we fully expect other challenges to continue moving forward and to see more challenges to these programs uh, in other uh, jurisdictions. But right now it is on that uh, race conscious uh, presumption. Okay, so uh, I, I guess I gather from that, uh, we'll wait a little bit longer, maybe down the road <laughs> to hear more about it. Yeah, and, and I think that there's, it's going to be a very complex response from SBA, DOJ, and the various business community, uh, business organizations uh, moving forward. I mean, this thing's not going away anytime soon. The problem is that the injunction that they faced in Tennessee basically triggered SBA to freeze 8A applications. Um, so I know a number of companies that were in the middle of the process um, and were moving you know, quite well through the, through the background checks and, and, and analysis of their firms. Now everything is on hold. Uh, there's even concerns about what this implies for existing 8A companies that are under new contracts or pending 8A awards. So it's still very much up in the air uh, I think we need to put that on the list of things that we need to watch as a committee and as we're moving forward um, with our recommendations for GSA. But I think some of these things with regards to outreach to non-traditional communities or even bringing more suppliers into the federal space, there's 100% grounds for that. Uh, and even a 2022 DOD report from the Undersecretary for Readiness talking about the lack of the, the shrinking size of the supplier base at DOD uh, becoming a national security issue. And she specifically pointed to SBA and SBA programs as ways of addressing that to bring new market entrants, which are the terms that we are using here, bringing mm. new market entrants into the federal space. We don't necessarily have to define that as race conscious or anything that would trigger external objections but the idea that we are going to use existing programs like community navigators and things and bring those folks in and try to figure out how we can get the word out and bring them into the marketplace, I think, is a safe way for us to continue moving forward while still keeping an eye on these other challenges that we're facing. Okay. So one suggestion I make, um, so Mamie and, and Nigel and, and Daryl, is we can connect with Antonio Das, who is one of our fellow members, and he's from SBA. So he's brought 8A folks before to speak to our subcommittee here uh, a while back. And I wonder if we can follow up with Antonio. Um, the things that you were talking about, Nigel, maybe put that in a, just a brief email to um, Farad, uh, Christine, and myself. And then we can connect with Antonio to see if he has, maybe he could even speak to that himself or, or bring somebody from SBA that could address it. Because he's been very helpful before when we needed input from SBA. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. You know, I just kind of want to add on. I think that the discussion is rich in that it's, um, it's SBA discussion around SBA being a solution provider by making sure that the things that they are trying to do to create new entrants but it's really a bigger issue, right? So I think we need to talk also around having the right kind of speaker who can speak to um, barriers that may be being created for new entrants, right? That may be from the standpoint of the business side, the political side. I think we, that could be a really rich discussion for our awareness for this committee and for us to bring that, heighten that discussion with the administrator, because we know that there are, there are business issues, now there are political issues, and there may be some financial issues that are, are keeping entrants from even getting in the game, right? So I just want to make sure that I want to highlight what I'm hearing from Daryl and Mamie and you, Nigel, because although y'all are saying the same things, there it's not just a it's not just a clear cut focus. It's it's happening across multiple um there's multiple reasons why we don't have as many new entrants. 
right? Yeah, yeah. We need to be able to, to say that out loud to the administrator so that they don't, we as a gap fact don't just try to fix one problem, which may be the SBA problem by letting the 8A firms go on through the process and get through the legal standpoint. When we recognize that access and opportunity are also a problem, right? So we just, I just think we need to heighten the entire conversation, recognizing um, that we have forces and bear things that are happening, right? In this space, we're having much like the um, much like the Americas, we're having wildfires and tornadoes and hurricanes come <laughs> in this space. And we want to make sure we create the right kind of barriers for, for winning um, so that we can win as a country. And I think also highlighting the important conversation of this affects our ability to be competitive as a country. So we can move from this language of affirmative action to competitive action. And I think that's where we have to help. Um, we can help the administrator and people to clearly understand that it, for us to be competitive, we have to be environmentally friendly, and we also have to be entrance, new entrance friendly. So I just say that, David. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate everyone's comments. And Farad, you said what I was thinking is that um, showing the sort of the business value of it, in addition, I think is really quite important because I think there's a subtext of there's no business value in doing diversity and inclusion, but I think there is not only for the people who are seeking opportunity, but for those who need basically their um, output as, as workers and companies. Um, and the more we can document the business value, I think the stronger the case can be made for maintaining these programs and growing the programs. Right. Well, thank you, David. We're going we're gonna to make sure we include that. So I, as we get to our industry groups or, and, and also the maturity model, let's let's highlight this kind of, kind of conversation. So we have a speaker and that speaker may be an administrative side or to help us to build our own awareness or it may be in the public sector side. So we can make sure that it's memorialized and spoken out loud. So let's yeah. talk, to, talk through that. Let me add a comment here. I think this is a really, really important conversation. I think as you're looking at your recommendations, both for new entrants and maturity model, you can look at it uh, two ways. You have more specific recommendations like the challenges, the actual maturity model, but what you're talking about, they're broader, more system level recommendations that GSA can influence. So almost two levels of abstraction, if you will. The more specific strategies, and then the more uh, broader, uh, higher level, uh, making a statement, you know, from a committee level, we feel like this is important for GSA to, to play in. So I, I, I see that playing nicely with these two areas that you have here, because I think what you're talking about could actually impact both of these areas. Uh, but that's just a thought for you all to consider. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think that's important towards really uh, the, the outcome that it was desired around this group coming together. So um, we're going to talk about the speaker discussion. Or do we want to go into our groups and come out of that? I know we just had a great discussion about speakers, but um, I just I want to make sure that maybe we can we can use these subgroups to highlight speakers that are going to speak to the new entrants and speak to the climate and acquisition maturity model. Um, I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I just, I'm, I'm, this is democracy. So I'm asking if we should maybe house that kind of conversation, additional conversation in those groups. Okay. Okay. So well, my, my, my suggestion would be for, uh, for those who are participating in this meeting, um, ideas that you have for speakers to put those in an email. We've done like a shared document. We can also do that. But um, just a way to organize it so that we're getting your ideas on people that you think we should bring to either a public meeting or an administrative meeting at this level. And then we can have that conversation at the group level. But, but if you have some ideas right now, I think we would like to hear those, if you, you know, something that coming to mind. Okay. 
no discussion on that. We'll we'll make sure that's a part of our, our work group discussions. Um, so we have the work group output to November the 16th. So we know on November the 16th, we're going to have a full committee meeting, right? That's everybody. Um, and so we have to have some outcomes from, we're going to be looking for some outcomes from our two subgroups so that we can have some information there. Um, Boris, I think that's the goal for the November 16th meeting. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. You as, as a subcommittee, um, you're looking at it from this point of view. Are we, you know, you're going to put together recommendations to present to the full committee and we'll follow a similar process as what we did before uh, the May meeting where you remember you drafted uh, some products and you did some coordination with the full committee. So by the time we got to the meeting, people were familiar with the recommendation. So it, it made it for a much easier uh, discussion and, and then vote process for recommendations. But but yeah, the, the goal is to get to November 16th. Obviously, before that day, there'll be some coordination uh, with some recommendations that you, you want to put forward to the group. Uh, as you're doing this work, keep in mind that sometimes you might run into, wow, this is going to take longer than we thought. So it may be the case where instead of two recommendations, you present one recommendation and then a status progress on another. The one thing I will say, I'm, I'm giving you all long answers today, I don't know why, but the one thing I will say is the charter for this committee will expire July 6 of 2024. So that's, and then the charter will get renewed at that time for another two year term. So these are two year terms. Um, at that point, the administrator of GSA may decide, you know what, we want to now look at small business, now we want to look at 8 programs. progress, maybe now we want to look at artificial intelligence in acquisition, or they may say, we want to continue our focus on sustainable procurement. So what I'm trying to say there is there's a limited window here of opportunity for making a difference in sustainable procurement. Uh, so that's, that's where I would make the argument that if at all possible, you want to definitely push for some recommendations on the 16th, even if they're not all, all there, but that's that's for you all to decide. Definitely not my decision. I'm just putting that out there for you all to consider. Um, so that so keep we, that in mind. So the, the time is is limited, but uh, so but you I said, feel like it's doable. You say it expires what date? Uh, July six of 2024. So we're looking at about 11 months or so, just a little under 11 months. And so the two scenarios is one, the, the charter gets renewed just as is, and then we go for another two years or the administrator, uh, and this will be a, a GSA leadership discussion, may decide that there is another topic in acquisition that we feel we want to refocus on. And then we potentially could refocus on something new. So that's to be determined. So those discussions will be happening kind of outside of the, the committee, but uh, just to want to let you know on the timing. I just wanted to. How does that affect the membership? Uh, members, so you all have terms. Uh, and then the terms, the, a member can serve up to six years. That's the maximum according to the Federal Advisory Committee rules. And then the, the terms will get updated as well. So the membership terms started in September. So that's actually a little longer than the charter. So, and I think we have a combination of two and three year terms because we wanted to have some overlap if there is some some changes. So that, that could affect the membership as well. And another long answer to your question, uh, for us. Yeah. No, no, I just want to make sure we knew because that means not only do we have to go hard and fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's great. That's what we know we have to do. Are there any other business that we need to talk around? So, I, I mean, the first is, are there, is there any more discussion on the two groups? Um, just anybody that has, and, and, and Susan and, um, let's see, uh, David, you, uh, Susan, Susan, any thoughts from you on the, on the, what we've talked about so far? Just wonder if you had any perspective or anything else you wanted to add. No, I'm, um, everything sound, sounds good to me. I'm going to think about the speaker piece a little bit. I definitely have some thoughts there, but want to want to mull it over a little bit more. Okay. Okay. 
Um, let me see. And then anybody else uh, talk about, I, I did want to talk about an idea that came up at one of our uh, internal GSA updates. So wanted to run it by you all, um, which Kristen shared in the group. But before doing that, I want to see if there was anything else. Uh, or for right, if you had anything else in mind before I talk about the idea that. No, we just, I, don't, I don't have anything else. Please go ahead. Okay. All right. So in the email that Kristen sent, she had a, a an idea that came up here. Uh, let me see. Talk to this a little bit. Yeah, there were some points. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing because, yeah, not, not really that relevant that we look at the, the document. So we update Jeff poses every couple of weeks on what we're doing in the committee. And then he brings his leadership team usually. And uh, Nick West, I don't know if you'll remember Nick West, he spoke uh, one of the early uh, full committee meetings. So he leads uh, the internal part of GSA that has to do with acquisition policy that affects GSA. And so when we were meeting with Jeff a couple of weeks ago, Nick had an idea of something maybe this subcommittee could consider. So the idea had to do with, and I invited Nick to join, but he actually had a meeting with the administrator earlier this afternoon. So he might join a bit later, but I'm not sure he's gonna be able to. So, so the idea Nick had is, would it be possible for, or would this be an interest area for the subcommittee and industry partnership uh, to look at the process of building an acquisition strategy? So you will almost take a, we've been looking at the industry perspective so far, this will take a little different perspective. This is looking at it from the government side. So when you're building an acquisition strategy, those of you, I mean, I think all of you will be familiar with that process. You're thinking about, okay, here's a program down the road. I know I need to look at the market for this set of requirements that I have. So I'm gonna think about what my performance work statement is. I'm gonna think about the funding that I'm gonna need, but I'm also gonna think about source selection, criteria, compliance, and all of the things that go into an acquisition strategy. So the question was, when we're thinking about sustainability and climate change, is there an opportunity to put together policy or practices for GSA to consider how would we best get the, the marketplace to address sustainability in this program. And in terms of like, what kind of uh, source selection criteria would we wanna put? Because those of you who are in the industry side, you competed for your contracts and you know, you, you go into source selection and you get evaluated based on what the, the RFP has. So are, are we, do we wanna focus on what kind of criteria, how we actually ask for vendors to come in so that we make a go, no go decision, yes, they can meet our sustainability requirements or no, they can't. Or do we have some evaluation criteria so we can grade the various uh, proposals that are coming in, in terms of how they are proposing to do, uh, meet the sustainability requirements of this acquisition. And then the third element is how are we going to do like the QAS, the Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan. That's another artifact when you're doing an acquisition. In other words, how are we going to ensure compliance that if they come to the table with, you know, three vendors, they have different approaches to meeting the sustainability requirements. Let's say they get the contract, how are we going to do the compliance and surveillance afterwards? So thinking about sustainability a little bit more from the government side, and can we bring that industry lens to think about what would make the most sense? To, that should the government focus on um, criteria, source selection, evaluation factors, or should the government really focus more on compliance once, or actually you're gonna think about both, but it, it's about, is there something that the subcommittee could, could entertain and maybe within the context of those two areas, or perhaps that's another area that you would consider in the future to, to look at, again, acquisition strategy, is there something that we can do to influence uh, the acquisition process well before even we get to the point where we're looking for vendors to come in. So that's, that's kind of the big picture. Um, David. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a basic question about what you just said. I could envision a, an officer, procurement officer, choosing the best among a number of alternatives. 
that, that the evaluation is on a relative basis, as opposed to, or in addition to, you know, quantifying the sort of the climate benefit of choosing a particular. Are, are we talking about sort of the first one or the second one or both? I, I think we're talking about both. And, and it's really looking at, is, is there an opportunity here for, for this subcommittee to bring some ideas to GSA recommendations that will help GSA really think about their acquisition strategies because that's a whole process. Building an acquisition strategy is a big deal, uh, especially if it's a big program. Like if we're looking at a big acquisition, uh, it's, it's a big deal. But it's just really how to think about sustainability and climate change when you're building your acquisition strategy so that you're, you're thinking about all the options in, that's going to give you the best outcomes at the end of the day. That, that makes sense. Yeah, Sorry. it makes sense. And I think we've talked about this, not only in this committee, subcommittee, but in other subcommittees, and maybe even the full committee is, does, does GSA or the government kind of have a, here are the targets we're trying to hit? You know, what, what areas of procurement will help us hit those targets, which is kind of a, a sort of a bigger macro question than sort of the individual decisions. And that's what I'm trying to understand is sort of the context yeah. of all of this. Yeah, yeah, it could definitely be at that macro level. And, and this is really, if you think of the acquisition life cycle, um, this is like, we're, we're like very early on. Like this is like, okay, now I've got, you know, $200 million for this program. And so now I need to think about long-term, you know, how am I going to get to the outcomes that I need? Uh, maybe a much smaller acquisition. I have $2 million, you know, but this is very early on in the life cycle, well before you make a contract award and then the contractor starts performing. So this is kind of getting way up there. And, and the reason Nick brought it up is because GSA, the way we do acquisitions at GSA, so there is a whole policy, the GSAR. So there's a companion to the FAR, there's a GSAR and, and Nick's team manages what happens. So I see Cash is just trying to get in. Uh, Nick's team manages what happens within GSA in terms of policy, how to do acquisitions, uh, the workforce, and all of those things. So that that was the idea he put together, um, and he can definitely add a little more. But I I, I get your question. I want to see if um, if you all have questions. Um, maybe I can try to help clarify here, because it's a very generic thing that I'm putting here on, on you. And it, we just started talking about it. So oh. to me, it sounds like it's two tracks and you can tell if I'm wrong or right but one track is are the are the or the companies that, that GSA is trying to procure are they um I guess adhering to or advancing sustainability in their businesses that could be one thing mm -hmm. um right. and the other track is how are they bringing in what are some of the policies they could change to bring in new entrants mm -hmm. Would that be, and, and you'd like to talk about policy around that? Right. Like and criteria on people that are, you know, on RFPs. Yeah, we're helping the government. So much of the work of the subcommittee has been looking at industry, but now you're kind of putting your, your government hat on. So you're planning this acquisition now from the acquisition strategy, which is a whole I mean, there's a whole set of rules on how to do an acquisition strategy and all the people you bring to the table and whatnot is how do you think about the, the sustainable uh, and climate change aspects of that program and how are you going to be able to determine which vendor is going to offer you the best solution from a sustainability point of view? And then after you get awarded the contract, how are you going to do the compliance surveillance of that? then they're delivering to you the, the solution. So it's really thinking, and you think about all of that at the acquisition strategy stage. This is before you even put together an RFP and even an RFI before anything goes out on the on the street, well before. And so how big is G-Star? Is it about this thick? It's huge, yeah. <laughs> yeah, G-Star, you know, like the FAR. The FAR is massive, G-Star is pretty massive too, yeah. Because I think if we were going to do something with that, we would need a better understanding of what's in G-Star or at least at a 50,000 foot level concept stage, you know, what are the areas, what goes into their strategy? 
Yeah, and that that we're only be looking at the part of the GSAR. So I mean, we won't necessarily have to get into the GSAR, but just the part that deals with acquisition strategies, which is a sliver. It's not, you know, okay. the GSAR deals with the whole life cycle. Okay. Acquisition life cycle. This is just on the on the front end. So that, it's an idea for you to think about. That's something that might be of interest. And we can definitely talk with Nick West some more just to explore a little bit of what, you know, dig in. That's that's what I understood from Nick. And I, I was hoping he could explain it himself a little yeah. better. But, but go ahead, Farah. No, no, no. I just want to make sure, you know, we've talked around that environmental concerns could be barriers to entry for people. And so I just want to make sure that I don't find myself in this group talking around new strategies when we we may create new strategies that will create less new entrance. <laughs> okay, so 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 you're bringing a good point right there. So that's that's a really good point because then how do you help the government think about a strategy that is not going to do that? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so that's that's, that's like, a good point. So you can help the government think. Let's let's do the opposite of that. Yeah, let's that's do something that will bring people to the table, not leave people out. Right, right. Because yeah. I know this, the economic strategy of doing that could be, you know, you get people focused on the shiny objects, but ultimately the bad part is that you eliminate new entrants because we talked about phasing and creating phase in approach for right for diverse or people who are not as advanced in e ESG so they can get a chance to participate. But if we right. go straight to how do we pick the person who has the best package and how do we use them and enforce that, then we've eliminated a group of people. So I just want to be right. mindful of how we do that. Mamie, you have you had your hand up? Yeah, you look, I'm challenged around this the the hand on the screen. I saw your hand. <laughs> So, but, yeah. and, um, so I think the government can strongest can can increase the strength of the compliance arm of contracts. So if um, if the big boys come in and you request a small business plan, and I'm thinking about compliance because I was over the disadvantaged business enterprise and the airport concession disadvantaged business enterprise for FAA and I had compliance activity at all the airports regarding um, Title VI activity as, and, and those airport improvement dollars. So, um, and I heard from small businesses that did direct contracting with FAA. There is no enforcement. You they. They can be part of the plan to win the contract and they're included as a vendor, but they're not getting opportunities to work on the contract once it's awarded. So that's where the compliance piece comes in. That And that is also from the small business community that you're gonna get your new entrance as well. So that, that arm needs to be strengthened. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm challenged on the hand thing too, but um, I kind of feel like getting in early at the strategy stage can be helpful for us, Farad. Um, and it, I look at it a little differently. I feel like we can prevent the um, the exclusion of new yeah. interests if yeah. we write policy or help with policy that will um, make sure that they're always included at every stage. Yeah, there and I and I'm not disagreeing. I just want to make sure that that's you got a good point. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I think you you all are bringing a good point here that this is an opportunity to really help the government think about when you're building your strategy. How, we can do both. We can increase new entrants coming and meet the uh, sustainability requirements. Actually, bring bring some innovative new entrants because of that. Uh, but in, in doing, I think for us, you really hit it uh, perfectly. It's like in doing so, are we going to create um, this incentive or are we going the other way where we're actually going to make it easier and more inviting for, for new entrants to come in and but, do things that make sense so that, it, you know, we, we all achieve our objectives. But that new entrants would be part of your criteria for them to even bid on, on the proposal that they are part of the team. Right. 
But then you got to follow up and find out, did they actually get opportunity to work on the project? The, the dollars flow to the new entrants. Right. 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 We, we want to do that. And then also in mindful of what we what we address in terms of sustainability and climate change, where where those requirements then able to get the really the, the best solution, the best vendors, including the new entrants. And then once they have the uh, <clears throat> the award that they like you say, maybe they're actually getting the, the, the dollars <clears throat> and they are complying with the requirements that we put on the contract as well. Yeah, but again, I stress the compliance arm as well as the begin. It's the strategy before the RFP is out there, but it's right. just like the mentor protege program um, around new entrants in the system. Uh, what's the follow through and over over what what's the oversight on that mentor protege aspect, and is is it a healthy relationship? Right. Right. And I think we've talked about that, that what you're talking about, the mentor protege program is one of the areas that this subcommittee had identified as a uh, topic for a for future. So that's, that's still on the table. It's on the radar. Um, yeah. So it's not yeah. a new tool, but it is the compliance of it and the mm -hmm. enforcement of it. That, that, that's, how, that's how the big, the big company is playing in the game, but that protege is supposed to have development and become independent in and of itself. Right, right, right. Right. Are Any you, are other you, thoughts? Um, Nigel, go ahead. Are, are, you, are you performing the proper oversight to ensure that it's a mutually beneficial structure? And exactly. Are, right. we bringing, are we bringing the new entrants to the marketplace, but are we making sure that the government is receiving the competition that brings that best value to the table? Right, and, and you're thinking about that in your acquisition strategy. That's the beauty of the acquisition strategy, that you are actually thinking like way a few steps down the road, exactly what you're talking about, Nigel. Right. Yeah, so I just want to make sure I understood. It, it appeared that I may understood what he was doing, but I'm not saying what he was doing was not right. I just want to make sure that we have a a, a robust, holistic approach to this, to ensure that we're still achieving what goals that we have from the procurement and environmental side. Well, I, I think it's it's not mutually exclusive. I think the the underlying purpose of this committee was to identify new entrants and bring non-traditional folks to the larger growing ecosystem of environmental sustainability, climate change as a business, right? As, as, as things that GSA was going to be driving through their policies, right? So I think inherent in that is how do we bring new, new companies, new faces, folks that are non-traditional, into that marketplace, but do so as Mamie was talking about in a way that ensures that they're actually getting real access to contracts and value, not just, you know, we bring a bunch of companies to the table and they're on a list somewhere. Right. Yeah, that, that they actually, they, they receive points uh, uh, for winning that procurement, but mm -hmm. the execution of that procurement is not happening not the way the government envisioned it. And the, to me, the accountability, the government has to hold their feet to the fire on it. If yep. you want to maintain a, a, a viable list of new entrants coming in. Yeah, and I think you raise a good point, Mamie, and, and this is an opportunity to, to think about that at the, at the early phases of an acquisition. So that's, as you're saying, you know, like, it's, it's there's things that could be done, and this is where you start looking at, are there some recommendations, suggestions that could be given to GSA to consider what you just said that made me at the, at the strategy level? Yeah, so, so in the airport environment, we would have to ensure that the disadvantaged businesses were actually performing the work. And not... not saying, oh, they couldn't do it, so we didn't um, know they're no longer 
a part of it, whatever. Right. Right. And, right. right. and you had a, I mean, you had a compliance plan that went along with those contracts, I imagine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So please take that feedback back to Nick and tell him we thank him and we look forward to figuring out a way to work together. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a little different take on, on what this subcommittee is being really focused on the industry side, but this is kind of putting your government hat on and thinking of, at it from early phases. Like if you all were acquisition strategies, you're trying to build strategy for you know small programs, big programs. When it comes to sustainable acquisition, where are we going to get the most bang for the buck? Where is going to be most most helpful to the government? And I think that's that's helpful. So I hope that that makes sense to you all. I just I know Nick Nick is a lot more articulate when it comes to this area. This is his his field of of expertise, and so is uh, Stephanie. She was a contracting officer for years, and so she really lived this stuff. No, we got it. Thank so you. For us, would this be something we would um, talk about as a group, or would we add another subcommittee um, discussion around this? Or Did so the, the idea here is for this subcommittee to consider that as a topic that you would take on, potentially, not necessarily for this cycle on uh, November 16, but perhaps the next cycle, you know, the next round. But, but it's something that, and the, what's interesting, is this is something that Nick expressed an interest on. So it will be something that will help GSA. And that's why I think it's, so anytime GSA comes to us, I'm, I'm paying attention because this is about what can we do to help GSA. Think and through. I think it will have the most impact because it's at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Mm -hmm. Then they really do want to help. So yeah, most yeah. Of us coming up with stuff and trying to push it up the flagpole, and they don't really care. But this right, time. right, and and the the maturity model and the the new entrance, the challenges. I think those are excellent areas that would really help more in the tail end. Mm -hmm. um, but are also strategic in nature. So they're, you know, they're not just in the tail end, but I think this will be another topic for you all to consider. Yeah, thank you. So um, oh, I think we're at the, the point in the agenda where we ask for public comment, is that correct? Yeah, we. I don't think we have anybody. I saw uh, Cassius, you joined in the conversation. So maybe give you this opportunity to to weigh in. Um, I was presenting to the group a new idea that came out of our updates with uh, Jeff and his leadership team, uh, looking at acquisition strategies. So I don't know if if you had a, a thought or an idea, please feel free to share your your thoughts. No, th thank you, Boris. I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I really just have to appreciate the spirit of conversation, particularly about the mentor protege program, because that was a program that was put in place to try to help um, folks, particularly in underserved markets, achieve and be a part of uh, the procurement process on a procurement side. So I really do appreciate those comments. Um, other than that, uh, I, I think that we're asking all the right questions. I think it's headed in the right direction. And I'm just looking for just more of engage, engaging conversations when we get to that point. Okay. And, and of right. course, always for uh, th thank you for keeping us uh, on 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 uh, on time for where we're supposed to be. <laughs> That's right. All right. Thank, thanks, Kasia. So um, let's see, Farad. Uh, let me take a look and see if there was anything else on the agenda because we can definitely. Um, so I think that's our public comment area. Um, as far as follow-ups, I think we uh, maybe we can just recap quickly the action. So you all are going to think about speakers. Um, I think for now we can you know we can do that via email to Farad, Kristen, and myself. Uh, we you have the schedule, so be sure to check your calendars. Uh, the dates that went on that email that Kristen sent are the right dates that should be on your calendars for both public admin meetings. Uh, we also talked about who would like to participate in the different groups. Susan, I got your um, request to be added to the maturity model group, so we'll be sure to do that. And then um, I think Farad and Kristen will send some more information to get those, those groups started. So we're, we're going to try to get some meetings on the books to start those conversations. And then um, let me see, I think. 
yeah, there was some ideas, some speakers, and I know we had quite a bit of discussion on Title VI, Title Seven. So be, please be sure to send us some emails with some suggestions on that. I think Nigel, I think I tasked you with some of that. Be sure we get some, some ideas. Uh, I did suggest Antonio Das from our committee would be a great resource. So we can definitely tap Antonio for, for the SBA piece of this. And um, I think that is all I had. I had uh, one more thing I had in addition to these areas is we are looking at, let me shift gear. So we are looking at the proposed FAR rule on sustainable procurement that came out a couple of weeks ago. So we, as a committee, have made the call that we want to proceed and have high level comments that come from the gap pack. And to do that, uh, we're going to start building a, so there's a team that's going to look at doing some high level comments. Uh, and then we're looking to do in a special meeting to discuss and vote on those comments so they could be submitted to the FAR Council. And the due date for the comments to come in is October 2nd. So I sent out a message earlier on um, to everyone in the committee to see if they would be available for one hour on September 21st. Uh, so not, don't need to get a, a decision here, but do look at your calendars to see if that's possible. And then we're looking to have a, um, a special meeting to review comments and then vote on comments. And then this will be a, a joint response from the, from the gap fact. I'll say it again, we're not looking for details. It's like 23 pages worth of text, but we're looking for just, uh, so there'll be a group that's gonna put together some comments and gonna review with you all. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion and then vote on the 21st. So that's that's something that we're working on and more to follow on that. Um, but I think that it's about all I had. I don't know if there was any other questions or any comments from, from anybody else. Just Boris, just a heads up, <clears throat> Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Legislative Conference is October 20th to the 24th. I know I'm going to be out of pocket and maybe some other folks on the committee are going to be extremely busy during that time. Okay. During okay. The conference, so just fair warning on that one. September, not October. And I'm traveling that day through the weekend. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I put out a call, but yeah, definitely re reply on the email that I sent if, if that date is not good for you. So then I'll take a look and see if we need to find a, an alternative date. Yeah, September. Yeah. yeah. All righty. I think that's it, uh, Farad. Did you have anything else? No, no. I just pray that everyone's hungers down and they're safe and family members are safe. And then let, let's pray for um, uh, everyone to get through the storm and the fires without uh, any loss. All right. Yeah, likewise, likewise. And uh, just happy to say I'm in Florida, but not on the path. Uh, Dave, I hope uh, you're doing okay, too. You're kind of closer to the path than I am. All good, Boris. Thank you. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and adjourn the meeting.